Thank you very much, Anne, for inviting me to be with this amazing galaxy of brains, uh, to be followed by a group of speakers, brilliant speakers, who can correct everything I'm about to get wrong. Uh, and hopefully we will have a bit of uh, a chance for conversation. Most of my work is actually in the fifth of Aaron's uh, field. So I mainly work on pretty practical, maybe quite micro stuff with businesses and startups or governments uh, and social enterprises. But this is a chance to stand back and ask sort of where we are. Now, President-elect Trump, and I have to be the first person to say his name, which I'm sure will be said a few more times, he was greatly influenced by Norman Vincent Peale, who was the minister at his local church and was the creator of positive thinking, which was the notion that if you only visualized a really fantastic possibility, it would surely happen. Now, I don't actually believe in that, but I do believe in its opposite, that if you focus only on the negative, then probably you are condemned for the negative to happen. So what I'm going to try and do is talk about about the negative and the positive, but hope to see if we can get to some sense of, of new possibility. And I'm going to start with Hegel. So Hegel was blamed for the idea, the end of history, the idea after the fall of the Berlin Wall that we would reach sort of culmination of reason in buildings like this. Um, I want to take a different idea from Hegel, which was the idea of thinking dialectically, that history evolves through the interaction of thesis, antithesis, and new synthesis. It doesn't progress in straight lines. It moves in more like a zigzag. And I think the question for us here is, what is that dialectic which we are in the midst of, and what new possibilities does it open up? So let me start with a thesis. A thesis probably proclaimed from stages like this many times in the last 20 or 30 years, which, to caricature, was the claim that globalization plus new technology plus liberalization would basically increase prosperity for everyone and empower everyone. And that's a story which is in part about the internet and telecoms. I have a PhD in telecoms. This is my background. You know, a much more connected world, flows of data and so on, uh, transforming the lives not just of Europe and America, but India, China and so on. It's a story about mobility, not just driverless cars, but in the next year we have cities planning uh, flying cars, vertical takeoff and landing, uh, and you know, a, a vision of dramatically enhanced um, mobility. I was a couple of days ago in Dubai, which has just committed to, the, to a hyperloop. It's a, a vision of you know, the world being brought to our, our doorsteps uh, with um, you know, drones delivering our shopping. So just as the driverless cars make cars and car parks redundant. This perhaps makes all the shopping malls of the world redundant. So if you're an investor in shopping malls, probably time to get out. Uh, it's a vision of machine learning and artificial intelligence as solving problems. This is the you know, visualization of the DeepMind algorithm which defeated AlphaGo early this year. Last night, we had the chief executive of Google in London. 7,000 people will be in their headquarters there. And we have a flood of extraordinary new technologies coming into the world in the next few years to help solve problems. We have a you know, positive vision of robots helping your kids to learn, perhaps caring for your elderly uh, parent. And all of this driven by dramatic cost shifts, not just Moore's Law. We're all very familiar with Law's Law, continuing declines in cost of computing. But if anything, an even faster decline in cost per genome sequencing, which you can see there. And in the positive story, an economy which is much more open to people to take part, declining costs of internet startups. Five years ago, it was $5,000. It's probably you know, $50 now in reality, the, uh, the barrier to start a new micro-enterprise selling things uh, online. Now, that's a story which I feel I've been part of, I believe in a lot of it. I think it's a story which is still unfolding. But there is an antithesis, an opposite view, which, again, you could caricature as this. Globalization plus technology plus liberalization empowers the few, perhaps people in this room, but either uh, disempowers the many or may even make them poorer. 
And in this antithesis, the same world of data, which has fantastic new tools, is also a world of big brother and control, where your attention is sold by companies to other companies, uh, and essentially it's a more manipulated world. Perhaps a world also where lies spread much more quickly on social media than truths do. It's a world where technological change has been structurally capital biased. It has tended to increase the returns to capital relative to labor in many countries across the world in a profound sort of shift of the structure of the economy. You may be familiar with this idea, the jaw of the snake. These are data from the US. So GDP and jobs went up in tandem from the Second World War till about the year 2000. And thereafter, GDP, productivity, has gone up, private employment stagnating or even falling. So an economy which people aren't able to take part in in the same way. And another sort of aspect of this, this graph shows where new jobs are emerging. And it shows that you're much more likely to see new jobs emerging in areas which have a high proportion of the population with a degree. So those places doing pretty well, the places which don't have universities, graduates, and so on, actually seeing very little job creation and what job creation there is, not very good or well-paid jobs. This chart has become quite famous, but also quite controversial. A quick show of hands. How many of you are familiar with the elephant diagram? Okay, probably about half of you. So this was a few years ago. Uh, an economist showed if you map the whole world population in terms of growth in household income, that's 0% there to 80%, and dividing the world's population from the poorest to the richest, what this shows in some ways is an extraordinarily positive story of income growth for much of you know, the bottom half of the world's population. These are the you know, growing middle classes of India and China and Latin America. But here, and at the top, you see the very rich having had an extraordinary period of uh, gains. But here you see you know, a large group, um, either little or no increase in income. And these are in part the sort of average or poorer populations of the rich countries, of Europe, of North America, whose median income, certainly in the US, has been stagnant now for 40 years. And this is an explanation of the weird politics we have here, uh, in a sense, with many people feeling they are not any more beneficiaries from uh, what's been uh, going on. One result of that is the questioning of trade. Some say we may have passed peak trade, this is world trade as a percentage of GDP, reaching a peak perhaps 10 years ago, falling in the crisis, and perhaps now falling again. Rather important for this institution. Here's a quote from uh, Jeff Immelt, chief executive of General Electric a few months ago. Um, he said, the globalization I knew based on trade and integration is changing, and that's why it's time for a pivot. And he's saying his company has to relocalized to assume that whole surge towards open borders, etc., has come to an end, and that we need fresh new thinking because we're in a different phase when that assumption of a steady march to globalization has probably come to an end. I hope today we will discuss, is he right? Is he wrong? What does this mean for Europe and the world? Have we passed peak work? Many of you will have seen the analyses that automation in the next 20 years could destroy perhaps half the jobs in countries like the US, a third or so in the UK. There's much argument about what the correct number is, but there's not much doubt that there will be further waves of job destruction, not just in relatively low-skilled jobs in manufacturing and services, but also economists in one forecast. Half their jobs will go in the next 20 years. Lawyers, accountants. And you may think that's cause for ce celebration, or you may think it's a terrible thing. Um, the more sort of detailed work on then who is at threat is also troubling. So this is a OECD chart on high performance work practices. I what share of jobs are uh, it's a cognitively intensive, requiring creativity and problem solving, and therefore less likely to be automated, even in the best performers, most of them European, Denmark, Finland, Sweden, Belgium, Austria, 
you know, you've only got 35, 40% of jobs in that category. And other countries, France here, Britain, pretty vulnerable to potential wipeout of easily automatable jobs. And perhaps even more worrying, have we passed peak democracy? I don't know how many of you have seen this sort of chart before. This is the percentage of the public who think having a democratic political system is a bad or very bad way to run their country. And this is by age group. And as you see, the younger age groups becoming more and more sceptical, not just in politicians, but in democracy itself. And there are similar charts asking people whether they were like authoritarian leaders who just got things done and didn't worry too much about elections, going up like that. And almost certainly, we have passed the period of peak Western influence. So 1950, Europe was nearly a quarter of the world's population. Now we're down to 12%, 7% by 2050, 6% at the end of the century. So whatever happens, there's been a huge shift in really the, the sort of shape of the world in terms of numbers, influence, power, which we're only just catching up with. Now, this is all in some ways the, the antithesis, and it's premised on the idea that a certain kind of progress may have come to an end, may be bumping into ecological limits or migration limits or aging or waste, but whatever else, it requires a different response. And much of the world's population think their country is going in the wrong direction. This is an Ipsos Mori poll asking people, is your country going in the right or the wrong direction? For the world as a whole, two-thirds think their country is going in the wrong direction, and the red ones are the most pessimistic, and they're pretty heavily concentrated in the European Union. France, 88% of French people seem to think their country is going uh, in the wrong direction. China is the great outlier the other way, perhaps because people thought the government was doing the poll. Um, I don't know. Uh, Saudi Arabia, likewise. So we can perhaps discount some of those, but there's something pretty serious going wrong with people's basically loss of confidence in the direction of travel of the world and perhaps loss of confidence in the claims made about how their prosperity would benefit from globalization, liberalization, the flow of new technology. And that's why you know, there is a great debate happening about whether this is a great reversal, whether we will therefore just go backwards to some sort of prior uh, type of world, some prior type of politics. And driving much of this is a sense of disempowerment. Much of the writing in the last week about Trump was essentially that you know, a swathe of the public, particularly perhaps men, white men in their 40s, 50s and 60s, none of them in this room, that they feel um, disempowered uh, in terms of the direction of change and therefore are angry and therefore are pessimistic and wanting an outlet for their anger. And there is in some ways an answer to that anger, a very old answer, which is project your power into a powerful leader, a big man, who will fix things, and who will fix things through the organs of the nation state. And the nation state will protect you from these forces, protect your job, protect your family, protect your future. And every country is different, but it's hard not to see some kind of pattern in these guys, Putin, Trump, Xi, Modi, Abe. No, they are all nationalist leaders promising state action, a populist kind of politics, a rejection of many of the claims and promises made by their predecessors, and all pretty popular at the moment. It's striking a chord, and it's outdoing the alternatives. So, the question for us is, do we just sort of despair? Do we reassert the old thesis ever more stridently, which is what is being done by some you know, media organs at the moment? Or do we look for new syntheses, which sense stick with our values, but try and learn from what's not worked, learn from what's not gone according to plan, and adjust into a new synthesis? And that's what I want to briefly share. I think part of the thing we have to do is clear away what I call zombie orthodoxies. In every government in the world, there are orthodoxies, things still being done, despite the fact they don't work, 
despite the fact there's no longer evidence for them, but they carry on because they're there. In a way, it's what Carlos Muedas was describing. Change is difficult. And it's worth all of you asking, what do you think the zombies are? Here's a quote from um, Paul Romer, recently appointed chief economist of the World Bank. He thinks much of economics is essentially zombie now. For three decades, macroeconomics has gone backwards because of undue respect for leaders with authority who've carried on essentially saying the same things, even though the facts on the world haven't fitted their theories. A lot of monetary policy, a lot of macro policy probably is in that zombie state, uh, which is why when some of those leaders act in completely different ways and it works, we may see you know, some unsettling. But I think there's orthodoxies in other fields too. I think, as Anne said, we've got to think about prosperity in a slightly more nuanced way. Yes, it is about income and wealth and having a job, but it is also about feeling power, feeling agency over your life, and it's also about a sense of belonging. And much of the political explanation for the Trump vote, or Brexit, or what may happen in France and Germany this year is more about belonging. It's not actually the poorest people voting for the populists, it's people who are relatively prosperous but don't feel belonging anymore, don't feel control over their community, their borders, their culture. So where do we take that? I want to just very briefly give a flavor of what some aspects of a new synthesis might look like and ideas which passed the power test. And what I call the power test is for any policy or program, does it not only spread power, but does it make people feel more powerful? And I think it's not a bad test to ask of any policy, not just does it make sense, is it technocratically wise, but does it answer that yearning for empowerment, which seems to be such a force in the world today, and such a force at the moment driving distrust or hatred of elites and leaders. So let me start with education, picking up very much where Carlos Muedos was. If you look at which jobs will survive the next waves of automation, they are jobs which will require creativity, problem solving, collaboration. It's not hard to predict the needs of 10 or 20 years' time. This is a World Economic Forum list of skills even now which employers are saying they're wanting, and some guesses about what the direction of travel is there. At the moment, pretty much every school system in the world is not focused on this, is teaching, as he said, you know, traditional disciplines with traditional pedagogy, which does not prepare people for the world of the future at all, which is why those small numbers of schools and school systems beginning to think about uh, project-based learning, learning models which link pupils in with you know, businesses and the outside world are so much more what we need. And it's not just that they're good from an economic point of view in preparing young people for the future, they also give them a sense of agency, of power over the world, that the world is something they can shape, not just a place they have to learn information about. That's one of the reasons I've been so keen on all the programs around coding. In the UK, we've now taken this to large scale. Other countries like Estonia have as well. And it's not just the technical thing of teaching six-year-olds or 12-year-olds how to make robots or code or websites, is also really getting them the sense the digital world is there for them to make and shape, not just to be Facebook users clicking like or don't like. And I think if we don't shift our whole education system in this way, we'll be missing an, a hugely important strategic opportunity and challenge. Now, there's a related um, point about invention. Again, this fits very much with what Carlos was saying. A fascinating paper came out a couple of months ago, which I think has been almost entirely unread, uh, which looked at the story of over a million inventors in the US. Where did they come from? How did we understand what turned people into inventors, patent creators? And it's a very detailed analysis, but essentially it shows that in the US, you're much more likely to be an inventor if you're from a rich background, if your parents have worked in science and technology, or you go to schools which gave you an early experience of invention and making. And they argue most Americans do not have that opportunities, those opportunities, and therefore the US wastes a huge amount of inventive potential which could be contributing to future prosperity. 
and they conclude, and this is a bit of jargon, that what we need is extensive margin policies which draw more talented children from low-income families into R&D. And that's a better way of driving up innovation than ever more incentives for venture capital, et cetera, et cetera. And in a way, this is one story of inclusive innovation, is get every child, again, from a very early age, experienced in making, inventing, shaping things, not just traditional pedagogy. So that's where empowerment, education, economic need align in a very different way from the present. I think there's a broader story there, which again, Carlos Moedas talked about, which is about how we think about innovation more broadly. The 20th century models were all things like Bell Labs or the fantastic Crick Center in London on genomics, which was big money, big centers, big government, big business. And there's still a lot to be done in R&D in that respect. But on the right-hand side, we have all these new kinds of innovation user-driven, service innovation, open source, open innovation, design, social innovation, digital social innovation, a fantastically sort of buzzing field in Europe and around the world. But the great majority of the resources invested by governments and the Commission are still on the left-hand side. They are not bringing in tens of millions of people into the process of inventing the new, creating the new, etc. And this is challenging because there are big interests on the left-hand side attached to the old models, attached to their money, and so on. But I think we really want people, again, to feel empowerment. We need to more, move much more onto the right-hand side. Now, for Europe, I think the challenge which follows from that is a kind of dual one. On the one hand, we have to maintain the dynamism of the vanguards. This was a map which came out about a year ago, and there's a new version coming out in two weeks' time, on Europe's digital cities, which are the ones really doing well on digital startups, digital scale-ups. And we have now got a lot of really very good buzzing hubs, you know, the Helsinki's and Stockholm's and Berlin's and London's and Paris's. And we've got to maintain their dynamism, which will be partly about bringing in talent, all sorts of things, but we've also got to spread it. Because as that map shows, there are many areas being left behind. And I think a lot of innovation policy is going to shift from not just the dynamism of the vanguards, but how do you speed up adoption, spread, getting the best business models being used by SMEs in you know, southern Italy or Greece or Spain, and not just concentrating resources on the leading edge. It's got to be both and, not either or. But that's something I think we're not doing so well as a continent, nor is the US, nor is China, I should say either. This is a good example of, I think, the direction of change. Um, I, I work a bit for the mayor of Seoul in Korea, and they've, they have this thing called the open test bed for the Internet of Things, and it's important for two reasons. One is it's turning residential areas of the city into experimental labs, which will try out new kind of sensors or energy systems or parking systems, so the public are, again, involved in the process of innovation. But it's also important because it provides a space where the entrepreneurs can work very closely with officials on rethinking regulation so that it enables the adoption of new models, not blocking them. Again, something mentioned by the commissioner. Regulatory sandboxes uh, in, uh, in fintech are another good example. Uh, UAE has a government accelerator doing this. These are new models where, as it were, the insurgent entrepreneurs are access the regulatory system far earlier than they've done in the past in order to speed uh, change. Now, I just want to finish on a couple of other, other perhaps more provocative points. I think we may be entering a new era where there's space for much greater state activism than in the past. Eight, nine years ago, we saw extraordinary activism by Europe, by national governments in response to the financial crisis. One of the you know, greatest examples of agility, boldness, risk-taking at a colossal scale to stop the world economy collapsing. Since then, we've seen nothing, <laughs> absolutely nothing comparable. And I think the question is, what, what, what would it take to get a similar level of ambition and agility and energy devoted to perhaps some longer-term tasks, not just ones which are about fix fixing an immediate crisis? Now, I'm just going to give a couple of examples which I think might be ones to contemplate. So, in India, probably the biggest public project 
of the world in the last 10 years has been UID. Well over a billion citizens now have a biometric identifier provided by government. That has allowed an entirely sort of new series of financial services to be created off the back of that, mainly for poor people. It's reducing corruption. In the medium term, it will allow totally different kinds of welfare to be created, where you know, government could lend people money for education, housing, starting a business, repaid over their lifetime. It's bold, it's big, and it simultaneously is state activism, but also empowering the relatively weak and the relatively poor. Could we have a similar one for Europe? I don't know, but worth contemplating. Or what about next generation infrastructures? We use an internet mainly still dominated by US-based firms. That's where the profits go. That's where a lot of the intellectual capital is. Should Europe be thinking about its own different vision of future infrastructures, which ensure money circulates much more here, which perhaps embody more of our values than some of the other values, and an infrastructure for the internet of everything? And how do we really increase our capacity for experiment, because some of these things you can't do as big top-down projects. Within business, formal experimentation has become much more mainstream. When Amazon wants a new service, it will do ABC testing. You know, try out different variants, see which ones work, then implement the most successful ones. We've got the beginnings of, I think, an equivalent shift in government. Finland has now created an office of experimentation in the Prime Minister's office. We in the UK, in our Cabinet Office, have a trials advisory service helping departments to think about fast experiments to test out new ideas. Um, across Europe, we now have experiments in basic income, which could be one of those bold steps to rethink policy for an age of automation. I've got some doubts, but in Finland, Netherlands, I think several other countries now, experiments underway. This was a huge thing in, I think this is in Switzerland. You know, what would you do if your income were taken care of? Would that be a liberating change in welfare, giving people much more freedom to start micro-enterprises, projects of all kinds? I don't know. The only way you find out is by experimentation. This is an example from this year which uh, I've been involved in, which is, again, in this same space called Good Sam. This was an attempt to create a smartphone activated medics. So volunteer first aiders can come to the help of someone who's had a heart attack on the street, so whatever it may be. So when they call the ambulance at the same time, a volunteer is notified, and often that volunteer can get to the patient much more quickly than the ambulance, and every minute lost after a heart attack increases your chance of death by 10%. So huge benefit in terms of health, uh, uses the sort of platforms of an Uber or an Airbnb but for a social purpose and mobilizes potentially thousands of members of the public to feel empowered to contribute to their health service, not just to be passive bystanders. And there's a whole family of innovations of this kind which link together public service delivery with new models of volunteering and contribution. And th this was only launched a few months ago, already across the world. This is the map of Good Sam volunteers. Almost without doing anything, we found volunteers all over the world, in parts of India, which don't have an ambulance service. It's being used as the basic ambulance service, whole health systems, like in New Zealand, adopting this. This is just one of many examples of using technology to empower and embody different values. And all over the world, of course, there's great experimentation around Technologies like blockchain. How do we use blockchain to rethink law or democracy or um, biographies in education? This is exactly the space where government now should be experimenting feverishly to find out what new options there are which align technology, empowerment, saving money, etc., etc. I want to end just by talking about democracy itself. Um, I showed you those worrying charts on how many people think democracy might be a bad thing. Uh, I think we have some alternative stories to tell here in Europe. This is just some pictures from the Descent Project, a European Commission-supported project, trying to create new generation democratic platforms uh, in use now in Barcelona and Madrid and Helsinki and in Iceland. 
And this is almost the opposite of government by referendum, which, being a Brit, I know it's not always a really good idea. Um, you know, yes, no choices for the public. This is a different direction for democracy where it becomes more iterative, more conversational, where the public can choose to be kept informed on issues, can propose policies and draft policies collaboratively, can decide and vote, can be engaged in tracking what happens. I think this is a much more positive vision of uh, empowering democracy than populist authoritarianism or traditional parliaments. And this is a survey just done a few weeks ago of European adults. How many would be interested in using the internet to vote online? How government spends budgets? 70%. Online petitions? 65%. Suggestions to their government about new laws and regulation? There's actually quite a lot of appetite out there from a public who anyway, every day, are using the internet for holidays or finance or talking to their friends. Why not also transform democracy? And we've got some good examples. Just a week ago, Portugal announced participatory budgeting using ATMs. So a slice of government budget opened up for the public to make proposals, vote on preferences. This is still, in some ways, early days. We don't quite know which methods work or which don't, but it's vital to overcome that barrier, that blockage, that sense of disempowerment, which is driving the antithesis in my language. And just a little thing to throw in um, about what might have changed since last Tuesday. This is an extraordinary chart some of you may have seen showing where inventors, and I talked about inventors before, migrated in the last decade, 21, 2001 to 2010. And as you can see, there was this huge sort of pull of inventors to the United States from Russia, China, India, but also, in fact, what you can't see, net migration from Germany and the UK, I think pretty much every EU country as well. Now, is this something we could now change? Do all those people want to live in Trump land, a land where science budgets will be squeezed, where the evangelical right will be more powerful than ever, Silicon Valley will be declared war on? I don't know, but I think a Europe which was agile, energetic, dynamic would say there's this most extraordinary opportunity now to shift some of those curves inwards. Yeah, we've got lots of anxieties on migration and refugees and so on, but we're talking about quite small numbers of people here, but small numbers of people with huge opportunity generating uh, impact. So, I hope you'll agree you know, we are in a strange point of inflection where a sort of thesis, a set of orthodoxes, a set of ideas which were very powerful for the elites of the whole world, including this institution, have been met with a pretty fierce antithesis, a very contradictory message about everything from trade and migration to economic policy. We have to decide how to respond, what's the most creative, positive way to respond. I hope I've given you a flavour of a few of the elements which could be in that. What I don't think is an option is just to stay there. And I don't think it's an option just to say, to give up and say, okay, let's all be Trumpers. Uh, instead, we have to, in some ways, and I'll end on this, um, think about this. So John Maynard Keynes famously said, when the facts change, I change my mind. What do you do? I think the facts have changed, some of them, but not all of them. And the question is, what are we going to do? Uh, how are we going to change our minds to, or are we going to stick as prisoners of the zombies? Thank you. Jeff, uh, I cannot uh, thank you enough for this extremely thought-provoking uh, presentation, which really so perfectly captures this moment in time where the challenges seem so overwhelming, but nonetheless, you can also grasp an opportunity. So I really want to warmly thank you for that. We are officially out of time, but I wonder if there are any questions, if anyone wants to pose them 
very, very uh, quickly, I have to say, uh, because uh, this is what's standing between us and the <laughs> coffee break. Uh, I see the gentleman over here in the middle. Please stand up so that a microphone can be brought to you and ask, uh, introduce yourself and ask a very, very brief question, please. So my, so my name is Adam watson Brown. I work for the European Commission in DG Communications, Networks, etc., etc. And I have um, a question for you, which I wanted to ask the Commissioner, but maybe um, you're even better, which is um, getting beyond hubs for innovation. How do we get to places like Stoke, Alsace, Lorraine, and other, um, and other um, areas which are characterized by mono-industrial um, towns? Because it seems to me that it's not just a question of holding world cafes and things like yeah. that, yeah. but concretely, how do we include them in economically? Thank you. Very good. You can pass, uh, the, uh, uh, can pass it down. Yes, him. I'm Nikos Kastrinos. I work in DG Research in the Commission. Um, I want to ask you about the sustainable development goals. Are they zombies or are they a new <laughs> synthesis? <laughs> Okay, and pass it on. We'll take a third one very quickly, please. Okay, thank you, Thomas Arnold, DG RTD as well. Mm -hmm. So I could also have asked the question to the Commissioner. I ask it to you. What can inclusive uh, innovation do to address the current uh, increasing disconnect of Europeans uh, from the EU project? And in particular, what are the major low-hanging fruits that could produce rapid results? <laughs> thank you. Uh, just, just can you can you take all of this? We have one more <laughs> here by Ruth Pazaman, and she is. I, I want to mention the first woman who's taken to the floor, which <laughs> I very much welcome. Ruth, uh, microphone, please. Microphone. Even as a woman, you can't do this without a microphone. So, uh. thank you. I'm Ruth Pazaman, deputy head of cabinet of Commissioner Tayson, doing social affairs. Um, if you put together your need for new state activism and points that have emerged about future of education and need to invest perhaps also in young people that don't have access to uh, opportunities. I mean, your point and, you know, also getting children to, to, to do, make things, be exposed to science and technology, etc. So, okay, I put these two things together. So what you didn't, in your state activism comment, you didn't mention this, but I think the issue of early childhood education and how can we improve this, do you have any thoughts on that? Very good. I think we have to go back to you now because these are all very meaty questions. So uh, Anne very unwisely said that I, I could talk longer than half an hour, so I apologize <laughs> for uh, rambling on. Um, very quickly, so first of all, you mentioned Stoke. Stoke is a city in, in England which is very deindustrialized and is a good test. So I've been involved in creating two schools in Stoke in the last four years, which are exactly schools on the model I described, where the pupils from 14 onwards work on real-life problem-solving projects, often with businesses, some high-tech, some not very high-tech, but they learn their physics and their chemistry and their maths through working on, for example, retrofitting homes, but doing it for real. And I think this kind of model is much more energizing, empowering, stimulating, and future-oriented than traditional pedagogy. And it can be done anywhere. And once you mobilize the schools, the colleges, and the universities to be agents of change, uh, you know, a lot then flows out from them. But they are very conservative systems, small c conservative systems. They are both the biggest opportunity, but in some ways, the biggest challenge. Now, on SDGs, I don't think SDGs are zombies at all. Um, and one of the, the, the projects my organization, Nesta, is working on is with the United Nations on how would you use some of the new tools of data and democracy to actually reframe what we call the collective intelligence of countries to achieve the SDGs, bringing together governments, uh, NGOs, UN agencies. We're working in Lesotho, we've been doing a bit in Moldova, other countries, on essentially uh, sort of taking SDGs as the goal, but we think almost from a clean sheet of paper, how you get a whole society to think more effectively together. That's a sort of 30 second summary of a much more uh, complicated um, project. And just on the low hanging fruit one, um, we, we do a lot on using challenge prizes to uh, as an open innovation method, some aimed at really quite specialized things like antibiotic resistance, but I think challenge prizes are, a, are also a good way of really opening up innovation to much larger populations. 
we're about to launch one a aimed at school kids on use of the Internet of Things, where schools will have to come up with good ways of combining physical objects, hacking their homes, Internet of Things, to achieve new value. And they do, you don't need big monetary rewards, but these are ways of turning innovation from something which just happens in the big universities, the big labs, into something really anyone, anywhere can take part in. And I think there are some low-hanging fruit there. But there's probably low-hanging fruit outside waiting to be eaten as well. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Okay, well, all that is uh, for me to say is uh, thank you so much. I think uh, we had a very strong, uh, thought-provoking uh, start uh, to the morning. Uh, but I want to be sure we're not doing this for entertainment. Uh, we really want people to internalize a little bit what is said up here, because ultimately we, of course, have to be these drivers of change and, uh, uh, and have to be uh, comfortable with, uh, with creating this new world uh, that uh, Jeff was talking about. So, but perhaps uh, let's give a warm round of applause uh, to Jeff. Thank you.